Mark 4 ends with Jesus calming the storm, and chapter 5 opens with them still in the boat, disembarking in Gentile country in the story of the Gadarene swine. Verse 1. So they came to the other side of the lake, to the region of the Gerasenes. Just as Jesus was getting out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came from the tombs and met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with the chain. For his hands and feet had often been bound with chains and shackles, but he had torn the chains apart and broken the shackles in pieces. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Each night and every day, among the tombs and in the mountains, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran down and bowed down before him. Then he cried out with a loud voice, Leave me alone, Jesus, Son of the Most High God. I implore you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of that man, you unclean spirit. Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged Jesus repeatedly not to send him out of the region. There on the hillside a great herd of pigs was feeding. And the demonic spirits begged him, Send us into the pigs, let us enter them. Jesus gave them permission. So the unclean spirits came out and went into the pigs. Then the herd rushed down the steep slope and into the lake, and about 2,000 were drowned in the lake. There is some variation between manuscripts as to the name of the location where this took place. It's most familiar as the region of the Gadarenes, and Gerasenes is another reading. It's on the far side of the Lake of Galilee from the Jewish side, and this is a region of Gentiles, hence the rearing of pigs. We have this unrealistically strong man living amongst the tombs who broke off his chains whenever he was shackled and who was too strong for anybody to subdue. We got the usual story of the demons testifying who Jesus is, but this time there's a variation. For one thing, there's many of them. And the other is this colourful tale of the spirits taking possession of a herd of swine and then being driven into the water where they drowned. We've previously seen demons convulsing their victims before being booted out by Jesus. This time we've got an escalation in their badness. There are many demons who have been harming the man that they live in. And just to show how many they are and how bad they are, they sent 2,000 pigs to their death. Mark does seem to be developing a salvific theme here. We've had a few castings out of unclean spirits, but we've also had the forgiveness of sins of the man lowered through the roof, and shortly we'll have him making a woman pure by healing. Here, though, we have a lot of unclean spirits sent off into unclean meat on the trotter. It's simply stated that they charge off into the lake. Volition for this action is not given, but there is a fairly clear metaphor between this and Jesus expunging sins and destroying them forever. That's fine, but these events don't go down so well with the locals. Verse 14. Now the herdsmen ran off and spread the news in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man sitting there clothed and in his right mind, the one who had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demon-possessed man reported it, and they also told about the pigs. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed asked if he could go with him. But Jesus did not permit him to do so. Instead, he said to him, Go to your home and to your people, and tell them what the Lord has done for you, that he had mercy on you. So he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis what Jesus had done for him, and all were amazed. So Jesus doesn't let this man come with him, but he sends him off as a sort of disciple or preacher. Significantly, it seems that this fellow is a Gentile and is sent off to preach to the Gentiles, a rare event in Mark's Gospel. He shortly gets back on the Jewish side of the Lake of Galilee and launches straight into another Markian sandwich. Verse 21 When Jesus had crossed again in a boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him and he was by the sea. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came up, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He asked him urgently, My little daughter is near death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be healed and live. Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. Now a woman was there who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for twelve years. She had endured a great deal under the care of many doctors, and she had spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. 
for she kept saying, If only I touch his clothes, I will be healed. At once the bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Jesus knew at once that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing against you, and you ask, Who touched me? But he looked around to see who had done it. Then the woman, with fear and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, people came from the synagogue leader's house saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? But Jesus, paying no attention to what was said, told the synagogue leader, Do not be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except for Peter, James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue leader where he saw noisy confusion and people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered he said to them, Why are you distressed and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they began making fun of him. But he forced them all outside and took the child's father and mother and his own companions and went into the room where the child was. Then, gently taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. The girl got up at once and began to walk around. She was twelve years old. They were completely astonished at this. He strictly ordered that no one should know about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. So we've got Jairus, the synagogue leader, coming and asking for help with his sick daughter, but before Jesus can get to the house, news comes that the daughter has died. It's carefully set up to facilitate secrecy. Jesus did not let anybody follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. We've seen this before. Then when Jesus says the child is not dead but asleep, they make fun of him. He boots them out, goes to see the child with her parents and his companions and takes her hand and says Talitha kum, which is Aramaic and Mark translates it as little girl I say to you get up. This is Jesus' first resurrection miracle but there's some uncertainty about the diagnosis. Is Jesus the Resurrector, or is he just great at diagnosing coma? Then there's the sandwich story of the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. Bleeding of this chronicity in a woman must have been pervaginal bleeding, which would have made her religiously impure continuously for 12 years, the same age as the little girl. So why does Mark sandwich these two stories in particular? The little girl's whole life is 12 years long. She's sick and dying, but she doesn't ask anyone for help. She takes no action herself at all except standing up at the end. Her father, rather unusually, has faith in Jesus because he's a leader of the synagogue. Therefore, you'd have thought he'd be at loggerheads with Jesus. It may be that he's at a synagogue sympathetic to Jesus, or perhaps what Mark is saying is that when you really care about something, that's when your true beliefs show, and his faith was rewarded. In most Markian sandwiches, the bread is the simplest story and the filling has the allegorical, more subtle and deeper meaning. And that's what I think is happening here. The reader is to identify with both the girl and the woman. The woman has been hemorrhaging and this has made her spiritually unclean for the lifetime of the girl, 12 years. For the reader's whole life they have been unclean, but emulating what the woman did to Jesus, the reader can achieve spiritual cleanliness. And what the woman did to Jesus was nothing except have faith in him and touch his clothes. She didn't ask him anything. Nobody asked on her behalf. She specifically sought him out and believed in him. And that's what the reader is supposed to do. And Jesus affirms this in his conversation with the woman. That's very interesting because nowhere else in his gospel does Mark explicitly state that Jesus has any saving utility. But these two sandwich stories appear to imply that he does.